I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Andrew Pospisilic. His research is focused on the interface between epigenetic regulation and the disorders of complex traits in humans. He got his PhD in physiology from the University of British Columbia in Canada and later moved to Germany for his postdoc. In 2010, he started his lab at the Max Planck Institute of Immunobiology and Epigenetics in Freiburg, Germany. And in 2018, just recently, recently, he moved his group to the Van Andel Institute in the US, where he's now the director of the Center for Epigenetics. Dr. Pospisilic's use of in vivo models for understanding epigenetic stability and variation in metabolic disease has earned him several awards, including the 2015 JS GSK Award for Basic Medical Research and the 2016 Young Investigator Award from the Novo Nordisk Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us today, Doctor. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. <clears throat> well, thanks for having me. For, thanks for everybody for tu tuning in. Uh, I'm assuming because nobody said anything, the right slide is showing. Um, well, I'll go ahead then. Yeah. So first of all, congratulations to the Fragile Nucleosome organizing team and the whole community. I've certainly been one who has loved to see the epigenetics community and particularly the younger generation come together like this. Uh, I really think it's fantastic and it, it shows a unity that is um, yeah, maybe all too rare nowadays, right? <clears throat> so, uh, of course this doesn't, okay. So I'm at the Van Andel Institute, as uh, Melvin mentioned. Uh, we're in Western Michigan, and there's a focus at the Institute of about 35 PIs on epigenetics, Parkinson's disease, more recently metabolism, structural biology, and cancer. And many of you will know the, um, the epigenetics colleagues that I'm fortunate to have uh, within the center. Um, they include real pioneers um, of, of looking at DNA methylation in cancer, you know, and pushing it really into the human realm. Um, pioneers and leaders of, of the cancer, of the TCGA and cancer epigenomics as a whole, bioinformatic leaders in the field, individuals um, identifying novel histone modifications. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an excellent crew and a site of real, a center of excellence and, and a, a new shining light ever since uh, Peter Jones brought the epigenetics focus here um, in a real compact, tight, nimble institute. I'm also part of a metabolism program. I mentioned that mostly for met metabolic people that are interested in, in metabolic programming because that, that is something that's really growing here. And I think Angelica might be happy to hear this. I think we're one of the few institutes right now that's, that's still hiring. I know there's a lot of places that are on, a, on, on freezes and both in the epigenetic space and in the metabolic space. Uh, we're definitely looking to, to move forward and grow strength even in these precarious times. So write me, pass on the info. Um, there will be ads coming out, et cetera, um, but people can certainly talk to me informally. So enough kind of advertising. Um, I move on to this picture, which really, um, it, it highlights visually my, my kind of greatest scientific passion. Um, and that's how the genetic, the DNA template, not only do you get different cell types as Angelica nicely mentioned, um, but on the other hand, you have an amazing reproducibility stored into the DNA template that you can get a multi-trillion cell organism um, that is essentially uh, highly reproducible through time and space. And what I mean by that, so this is, uh, this is pictures of, of two twins that have been photo stitched together. It's a book by Martin Schuller. And you can see that you know, identical twins are phenomenal, right? One cell goes to many trillion cells and it comes out with the exception of a few freckles in this case to, to be the, the, the exact same output. Um, what interests us is, is when is that not necessarily the case? And so if you take a look at these two brothers, don't be fooled by um, the haircut. These guys are a bit different. And if my cursor works, look at their lips, they're different. The nose is different. Facial, facial width and structure, this twin on the right is definitely much more robust, his neck as well. Uh, and this isn't just because you know this individual has gone to the gym. We can we can find many instances of this. So, you know, a lot of my talk will be a bit more philosophical and not nearly as molecular as, as the Closey Lab does, and Angelica's great work. Um, phenotypic variation. You'll be surprised. Different people have different definitions for for where phenotype is derived. I think we can all agree that. Um, genetics plays a major part in the, in the DNA sequence itself. I think almost everyone would agree. 
environment plays a, diff a, a big role, but human geneticists actually completely ignore this yellow circle on the upper right. Epigenetics is considered a small part of environment that maybe is the link between genetics and environment. Um, and I think, you know, uh, all the pioneering model organisms like position effect variegation in Drosophila and yeast uh, highlight that even in the same environment at the same DNA, DNA sequence, you can have a, a really a rampant variation in phenotype. And I think that's what excites a lot of the people probably on this call, uh, you know, are the interfaces of these and the molecular mechanisms. So whether it's the genetics of epigenetics or epigenome wiring, or right in the middle would be, you know, HSP silencing of cryptic genetic information, for instance. Okay, so the other way to think about this, when you come from the disease world, which is which, which is definitely my background, um, is how that that DNA blueprint that comes about upon fertilization can be um, reproducibly programmed, and the, it, that's an important point to mention is this reproducibility aspect, because we've evolved, right? So we've evolved a certain amount of plasticity, we've evolved plasticity responses to certain environmental. Um, insults, and we've we've evolved a certain degree of variation, right? And so, you know, one visualization for the epigenetic role is is um, that you know genes and environment give us a trajectory, and then epigenetics can either cancel that out or exacerbate it, or certainly modify the the, the variability that's associated with it. And you know, we've been alive in this field in a minor role for a long time, starting with Drosophila, and and kind of looking at this at this interface between the generations, you know, the so-called Weismann barrier. Um, and definitely we've shown that, that there's H3K9 dependent mechanisms that are really important in the germline and H3K27 dependent mechanisms that are really important immediately after fertilization for setting some of these programs. And without full dosage, you still get normal development, uh, but you get, you, you get altered trajectories and compromised ability for plasticity. So I only raised that paper to highlight, this is probably how most people think of this plasticity. If this curve is the, you know, is your phenotype, if you were born a hundred times, you know, most of the time you'd land in the middle and epigenetics gives us the plasticity to push phenotype to the right or left, let's say, that's high blood sugar or low or obese or lean, these kind of ideas. But, but the, other, the other sets that we definitely know from nature are, are switch-like differences, where the same individual could be switched from state A to state B with, with two sets of probabilities. And I think the perfect example from nature for that is, is the, 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 you know, the uber famous um, queen bee versus worker bee, you know, essentially the same DNA blueprint. All queens are almost the same, all workers are almost the same and the two different phenotypes are dramatically different, but both have their own variation, and it's a canalization and a division of the variation. Another example would be the dung beetle, you know, the one on the right, the only difference was that the larvae ate more food and was born into a big dung ball. The one on the left, which has no horn, um, was born in a small dung ball. But the question is what happens with all the, all the beetles that were born into medium-sized dung balls and had medium levels of nutrition? Well, they all become either horned or not horned, and you never get medium horned ones. And so this is, while very philosophical and far from both human medicine and, and hardcore molecular epigenetics, uh, this starts ma making us ask questions about, well, could, pheno could phenotypes in humans, and therefore disease susceptibility, um, have different stable potentials? And if you look at through all the twin sets that are in this book, I, I've noticed that there's a, a number of reproducible features. You can see the easiest one is just to look at the facial structure and the width of the bones. Um, and you can find it in young twins and older twins. Um, you have to have a bit of an eye for it. Some people don't see it, some people do. Um, but it begs the question, could, could we be one of two phenotypes? You know, imagine um, that, uh, that, that you could be an A form or a B form. Now, about five to 10 years ago, we stumbled upon this phenotype or this phenomenon also in mice. So that phenomenon in, in insect world is called polyphenism. You know, when you get a queen bee and a worker bee or a soldier ant and a, and a worker ant. And if we take out one copy of Trim28 or Cap1, um, so these mice grow up completely normal. Trim28 is a is a silencing scaffold, you could say, that, that brings silencing machinery, DNA methyltransferases, set DB1 for H3K9 trimethyl, um, 
guided to DNA by crabs ink finger transcription factors that give the DNA sequence specificity. And if we take out just one copy of TRIM28, what we found is if you do a very controlled studies and you really control environment as much as you can and control parental contributions, we get two different types of mice. And you know, we're in the metabolic space, so, so it was interesting to us that these mice are, are either obese or lean, and the lean ones superimposed with normal. So let's say they're, they're obese or normal. And this is long since published, so I'm gonna run through these to get to some unpublished data. Um, basically, by co comparing these bizarre, this bizarre form of bistable epigenetic obesity with, with canonical high-fat diet-induced obesity, we came upon imprinted genes, polycomb regulated genes, and for a number of reasons, we narrowed it down to a set of imprinted genes shown here that are mostly paternally expressed, so they're maternally imprinted, um, that we believe is really critical to, to generating this bifurcation, this phenotypic switch. And the key experiment that showed that is that if we made independent knockouts of PEG3, which is one of those down here, or neuronatin, which is a second one, so two independent knockout lines, we again saw bistability in their metabolic potential, once in total fat mass, so that was it's hard to see on the body weight level, and then one in a, with a really dramatic difference if you knock out neuronatin, which is PEG5, uh, you get almost a 50% increase in body mass. So just to tell you, these ones in the right-hand side are, are brother, or you know, if these are all males, these two sets you find are genetically identical brothers born to the same litter, same mother, same father, same microbiota, et cetera, in the cage. So you can take a moment and imagine yourself 50% heavier. That's the phenotypic variability potential that we're seeing here as a reproducible consequence um, of, this, of, this, um, of this manipulation. So what about humans? You know, could this happen in humans? This is now a whole bunch of hand wavings, but it's intriguing. If you look at BMI distribution of humans, you rarely see the raw data um, because people do SDS scores and they do this because they wanna adjust everything over age, sex, et cetera. If you do the reverse, what I'm showing you here, you don't need any corrections because I'm only taking Caucasian boys, all aged six to eight years old. So there's no need to do any corrections. And then suddenly you see that a, a Gaussian fit barely fits the curve and we actually have a, a pretty stri striking bimodality to the system. And it, you know, an R squared of course fits it better because we, with two components, we fit the data better no matter what. But it's striking that that R squared is almost a perfect fit to a data set with thousands of individuals. So this is N. Haynes data um, from the you know, US epidemiology study. So, this has also been corrected for socioeconomic factors, geography, et cetera. What's intriguing about those curves, if you look, the green one is what I just showed you, and this is, in the two, this is kids born in the 2000s. If you compare it to about 50 years ago, you know, what you notice is that bimodality was still there 50 years ago. The center of the peaks are, line up perfectly between the, the lean ones and the heavier ones. All that's changed is the ratio of the peaks. And, from an epidemiological point of view, this is a this is a huge issue. You know, we hear in the public media that everybody is getting more obese, um, and the data show that's not actually true. The lean population, and you can see that here as the, the left peak, they're exactly the same BMI as they always have been 50 years ago, right? And the obese population is just about as heavy as they were. The only thing that's different is the, is the relative level of the ratio of these two populations. So the percentage of the population that's found in one or the other population. Now this is found across every ethnicity, so we don't think it's strikingly genetic or anything like that, um, or a gene environment interaction. Certainly if it is one, then it's one that's ubiquitous across all ethnicities. Um, and I won't dwell on it, but we, if you look at TRIM28, low individuals, so these would be individuals that let's say we can liken them to our knockout mice. They also have a, 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 a peculiar down-regulation of all those same imprinted genes that we found down-regulated in our mice. So that's the closest molecular feature we have to, to see that something similar is happening in humans. So it seems that there's maybe two types of obesity. In TRIM28 high individuals, they show no dysregulation of imprinted genes. 
if you look at shroom 28 low individual, so there's a real, a, a real substantial difference. So maybe we got two different types of disease. So, you know, coming back to my visualizations before, you know, this is kind of the concept that maybe trim 28 and this imprinted gene network are capable of, of facilitating bifurcations in your developmental trajectory. But of course, as humans, we never get to do that reproducible experiment, right? You're born once. Twins, maybe we can start studying, right? Um, mice, at least, we can go through hundreds of, litter ma of, of litter mates of litters, right? Um, and they can all be essentially isogenic. With humans, it's very difficult to explore that. Okay, so it's a bit of a wrap up of, of sort of, in case it was too fast, to, um, of, and some additional little points. So we've seen this bizarre polyphenism where we, can, where we see a split in phenotypic trajectory um, on black six and FBB backgrounds, also in F1 hybrids. We've seen it on multiple continents and multiple mouse houses through embryo transfer. Um, we cannot segregate it by crossing. And so it's definitely epigenetic, right? So it suggests that, that mammals as well can be polyphenic, right? I'm gonna go into new data. Um, now focusing not on trim 28, but neuronatant. So that was the one with a really big body weight change. And what we found here is interestingly that there may be a separate polyphenism. So where the trim 28 mice were obese, this is now looking at fat mass on the vertical axis and lean mass on the horizontal axis. Um, the neuronatin mice are both obese and so are they, they're either normal or they are both obese and increased lean mass. So they're gigantic, right? And you can see individual animal plots here. So it's really clear in the neuronatins that the trajectory is completely different. Um, I'll skip this. What we, from a physiological standpoint, what we figured out is the, the, the gigantism that we see is is due to an insulin, is due to a beta cell hyperplasia. So these are the insulin producing cells in the body. Insulin is a is a growth hormone if it's given at the right time of life. Um, and what we see certainly if we do Ki sixty seven staining um, is hyperproliferation in the beta cell compartment, enlarged eyelets, increased numbers of beta cells. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, hyperproliferation, even in a cell autonomous assays. So these are an organoid culture with absolutely no difference in the stimuli within the culture. And if in vivo, if we, if we kill that effect, um, and that's shown here on the right, uh, if we use a toxin to beta cells called STZ, we completely normalize um, the growth phenotype of the two trajectories. So the two blue dots here are the animals that were beginning to be lean phenotype, beginning to be the gigantic phenotype. We killed their insulin secretory capacity and replaced it with insulin pellets of controlled dose, and we no longer get the phenotypic trajectory difference. So we think we've identified the physiological source. Now the big question is gonna be the, meta, it's gonna be the epigenetic source of, of this developmental switch. So coming back to humans again, you know, can this be active in humans? So if we look, I, I mentioned twins a little while ago or at the beginning. If we look at UK twins co uh, cohorts, right now I'm not, I'm not separating twin pairs, I'm just showing you everyone in the UK twins da database. And we look at their BMI and neuronate and expression. What's interesting is that low neuronate and individuals have increased, increased BMI, so they're heavier. But what's really interesting is is this, it's the spread of the distribution that's increased. So we have just as many lean individuals and we have more individuals. So the, the spread has gone in, in, in both directions. Or you can say that the, that the lowest quartile has, has been maintained as much as, as the, the highest quartile has gone up. And if we plot fat mass discordance between twins, so now I'm looking at the differences between identical twins to look at variation potential, neuronate and low twins tend to have a higher discordance. This is true for fat mass. It's true for lean mass, implying that that gigantism aspect could also be true in the, in the humans. And it's true for insulin, which I don't have the data shown here. And here you can see in the lean and fat mass discordance. So basically twins that are up here on the far right are very different both in how fat they are and in how, how much lean mass they have on them. And I think what you can see is that if if twins tend to be neuronate and low, they have more variability and that's whether they
fall into what one would call concordant twins here in the, in the lower left, or whether one talks about discordant twins. And that, that point alone is very interesting that the, that the data sets already stably cluster into two different uh, populations. I think that's quite novel in the literature to, to consider that there's two stable sets of twins. Okay, in the last few minutes, I'm just going to mention the beginnings of efforts to now try to map what are the epigenomic differences between these, these sets. And I'm gonna just mention this one technique, which is an expansion of chip with barcoding and using uh, restriction enzymes instead of sonication or, or, or uh, MNAs. And the reason to do this is it allows us to barcode all the nuclei in situ before we fraction chromatin, it means that we can pool all our nuclei and then we can do all the highly variable steps of chip, all to, of all these samples that are shown here, these were all done in a single tube. So the, the fragmentation, the, the um, lysis, the uh, chip pull down, et cetera, all done in the exact same tube. So we suddenly have a much more quantitative scenario. This is H3K27 acetylation for promoter, active promoters and enhancers. And you can see really tissue specific, highly reproducible peaks in each pair of tracks. I encourage you to look that up if you're interested and, and, and reach out to me, I, I won't go through the protocol. But what this has allowed us to do, so now we've got our neuronate and mice that have two different phenotypes. Each track I'm showing you here in gray is from a different animal, from purified adipocytes, so real pure cell populations. And you can see that the epigenome programming of the individuals clusters in two forms. The giants use completely different enhancer repertoires from, from the lean neuronatins and from wild type litter mates. This is showing you know, one example where fewer enhancers are used upstream of a gene. Um, here's another where not only the promoter, but three enhancers upstream are, are completely turned on in every single giant mouse, but not at all in the lean. And interestingly, in the wild type animals, even though these are, these are all isogenic, we see a high variability in this region. So this, you know, it raises the idea of, of the kind of variable epigenome, you know, things like variably methylated IEPs that Ann Ferguson Smith studies, metastable epi alleys, these kind of ideas that we know are hypervariable even on the same genetic template. This is a heat map of those data genome wide. And I think they reinforce that point. At promoters, which are shown here, these are active promoters, K27 acetyl, we see very little difference across our three phenotypic categories. But if we look at enhancers, this is totally striking in my opinion. We look at the huge animals, about, oops, sorry, about 70% of the enhancers used by the huge animals are different from those used by lean and wild type. And I remind you, sorry, I keep on hitting my screen. Um, and I remind you, these are purified cell type. So 75% of the enhancers are different, even though we have normal adipocytes in essentially normal mice, the only difference is the one on the right are a bit bigger than the others. And I think you can see that clearly. There's about 50% of the plot that are only on in the huge animals and about 20 to 30% that are off specifically in the huge animals. And that's a Venn diagram for it right there, which is maybe irrelevant. So I think the conclusion of that is it's one mammalian polyphenism involves really dramatic enhancer rewiring, but I think there's few people that would have predicted that the enhancer ohm can be so dramatically different between two normal um, instances of a cell type. And I remind you, these are purified somatic cells that have finished differentiation um, and are, are, no longer are no longer proliferating. Okay, so that was a whirlwind. This is the team that's been doing it and you know, a great team that's taken the plunge to move to the US with me. Um, the key individuals are the, the two giants here on the right side, um, Leslie and Luca for most of the new data that I showed. Um, lots of important collaborators and funding resources. Um, and I will just leave up this slide, which advertises if we can still do conferences in the future, there's a fantastic one coming up um, in August of 2020. If we make it, uh, 2021, sorry, this is, uh, I just wrote this slide and I got it. So this is August 2nd to 4th, 2021. Um, and we've got great speakers. You can read the list there. And that will be coupled with the, um, the epigenomics workshop that we always do for grad students. 
Okay, I'll leave it there and stop talking. Excellent, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so I'll remind people that if they wanna ask some questions, they can raise their hand and I'm gonna mute them. Uh, so real quick, I'll, I'll ask the first question. So getting a little bit philosophical, like you mentioned at the beginning, and you talked a lot about these uh, identical twins. Do you think that, or can you speculate on this polyphenism? Is it due to one specific fork molecular decision that is taken early in the development that affects and has this specific phenotype variability, or is it just the aggregated influence of the dosage compensation? I don't know, some of these epigenetic regulators. I think it's something I struggle with. <clears throat> I mean, thinking of the GFP repeat cassette, thinking of data like the one stuff that Angelica showed and high C and the biophysical properties that um, can certainly compartmentalize genomes where all you would need to do is change the dosage of a single chromatin regulator and you may get many highly reproducible gene expression shifts. I'm, I am more a believer that that biophysical principle might be much easier for evolution to handle, that all you need to do there is get the genes into the right compartments or organize chromatin state around genes and, 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 and effectively regulate dosage of chromatin states if, if one can be so crude. Okay, yeah. Thank Certainly you. sequence is gonna be part of it. I mean, what we did there was, was um, hit trim 28. We're using a, a, a you know, sequence specific factors like neuronatin, et cetera. And we do a knockout of a DNA element and we can induce the bifurcation sensitivity. So I think it's all gonna boil down to the genetics of epigenetics as well. That's relevant for the human precision medicine side of things. But the mechanism itself, I think will be like I showed you with the enhancers, right? Listen, you know, of the 30,000 enhancers, 20,000 were super reproducibly different between the two cell types. That blew my mind when I saw that because, you know, you wouldn't even expect that for two different cell types, right? Yeah. You would expect 70% of the enhancers to match for many cell types. So um, I would yeah. say biophysics. All right, uh, so we have a couple of people raising their hand. Uh, so I just gave the voice to Mustafi Palavi. So uh, so my question was a bit uh, of a situation where you see uh, discordant uh, twins in terms of body mass. What if you change the diet habits? Will that shift uh, because often our metabolism and diet does affect the epigenome of the body. So do you think that will shift the change in the epigenetic marks in the enhancer regions or the particular uh, Gene. I think your question goes to the point of, of whether these, whether phenotypic bifurcations like this are reversible, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think and data from yeah. data from the polyphenism world and the insect world would would say that they are, but these programs are are very stable at the same time. So the work in the ant world has shown you can reprogram some subsets of ants to be others. But by and large, a worker stays a worker um, and a, you know, a soldier ant stays a soldier. I think in humans, we know that our obesity potential is extremely stable. You know, anyone who's tried to lose weight and keep it off knows that your set point is your set point. It's a very hard thing to fight. So while I would say theoretically they are plastic, I think they'll be very difficult to rewire uh, without either very early life interventions or very serious um, you know, nutritional epigenomic therapy, whatever that will turn out to be. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Balabi. Uh, so we have one question from the audience. So Jason Fan asks, Andrew, is there also a bifurcation for mal malnutrition population compared to normal? So we haven't tested that here. Um, what we have done is to start play around with maternal and paternal contributions and the role of diet there. Certainly, if you change the diet of the mother, we can seem to flip the switch on and off. Um, as far as malnutrition goes, you know that. So the diet we've used in mice to flip the switch on a bit is a high fat diet um, that can be thought of as either malnutrition or overnutrition, um, because high fat diet isn't an optimal nutrition. 
Um, I think this, I think nutrition in the mother in utero will be one of the things that has the potential to flip these, these triggerable switches. Um, I don't know if, the, so if the question is more geared towards anorexia or leanism, um, similar switches may exist. We've never seen it in our model systems. Okay. All right, thank you, Andrew. And uh, so, one, uh, so Carmelo, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so on the same line of what uh, maybe Andrew was saying before, um, uh, when you see this switch in terms of uh, different enhancers that eventually start to be associated with the regulated genes, it would be interesting to see if, for example, this is associated to a rewiring of the uh, genome, okay, in terms of in, in which is compartmentalized. So if there is or the appearance or disappearance of specific TAD boundaries, for example, they can be constraining such interactions. Yeah. Um, I, I would love to do high C on these. It's one of the many things we want to do uh, because with 70% of the enhancers being different, I'm sure there's gonna be either modified TAD compartments or certainly many modified interactions within TADs or sub-TADs. Uh, I'd love to do it. We haven't done it yet. Um, if someone wants to help us out in doing it, um, you know, write me an email. I think the cool. you know the, the beautiful thing to do would be to do it um, in early or in mid development, so in embryos, really early on when we think the switch is actually happening. Another point is that you know you said this one terminally differentiated cells. Okay, considering that you can de-differentiate the cells if you just push them with the right cocktail of transcription factors. So would they be taking a different trajectories to go backward and reestablishing their identity? That's a super good question. I mean, we certainly know from all the pioneering work out there, you know, of reprogramming cells that there's definitely legacies of the cell that came from even when you make mice. Um, I think that probably would go down, I, I'm sure you could get both results. Um, if you manage to reprogram a cell as effectively at pos as possible, you might wipe away the legacy. I wouldn't be surprised if you reprogram a giant and you got more giants at the end. Uh, certainly a great experiment to do. Um, unfortunately, you know, it takes us so much effort to even get a little bit closer to mechanism that we're, <laughs> we're trying to chase down that alley of where is the switch and when is it during development. Um, we do know that paternal and maternal fact, even paternal factors make an effect. So there's something given through the sperm that's also critical for flip, for deciding how much of the switch is flipped. Um, so it's not all going to be structure. It may be manifest in structure. But good questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carmelo. Um, I think those are all the questions that we have for now. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Angelica. And for the people that are attending the trainee talk, uh, we'll take a couple of minutes off for a break and then we'll see you then. And thank you everybody for joining us in this session. Great, thanks everybody.